Görgonat. Okay, let's make a start. Um, good evening, everyone. Kalispedasas. Um, let us first begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, before launching into tonight's seminar, um, let me give you an update um, of what's happening in the next few weeks. Uh, next week, we have two seminars uh, at the mezzanine level, both at 7 o'clock. On Wednesday night, uh, on the 4th of October, we have the 5th La Trobe University Dadalas Archive Seminar. It would be delivered by Peter Yanudis, and it's on the um, tragic events of Cyprus 1974 and the lobbying power of the Greek Cypriot and Greek communities here in Australia. While on Thursday, uh, our final seminar as part of the series, there's always extra special seminars, uh, uh, we have Emma Vasiliou speaking on small words with mighty power, a fascinating insight into the Greek language. Uh, furthermore, don't forget the um, upcoming October Film Festival. Um, the program is online. You can um, purchase tickets. There's still tickets available for opening night. There'll be at three venues, the Astor, Como Turek and also Borwin. Um, and also, however, before we venture tonight's seminar, allow me to welcome um, Professor Yorgos Anagnosu from Ohio State University. Uh, Yorgos, do you mind, can I embarrass you and ask you to stand up? So, <laughs> uh, firstly, um, greetings, Yorgo. Um, he arrived this morning from a 40 hour flight from Columbus, Ohio. So, um, despite the jet lag, I'm, I'm sort of um, pleased he's, uh, he's with us. Although his luggage didn't quite arrive in Melbourne, but that's another story. But <laughs> the, uh, the vagaries of international travel. Um, and Professor Nagnosu will be in Australia for around sort of six weeks. Um, his trip here has been funded by the University of Melbourne Walter Mangold Public Trust, which supports visiting um, research scholars. And, um, and Dr. Andoni Peperoglu from the Global Diasporas uh, Program has been busy preparing his itinerary, which includes a seminar at the mezzanine level of the Greek community in Greek um, on Sunday the 8th of October. And there'll also be a public lecture at the University of Melbourne on the 10th of October. Um, please book quickly. I think the venue has a limited sort of capacity. There's already sort of 100 people that have sort of signed up so far. Um, Professor Agnostou is an expert on immigrant America, especially um, Greek America. Um, Okay, and now, now let's return to tonight's seminar by Dr. Emily Hume, which looks at women philosophers um, in ancient Greece. The subject of women philosophers in antiquity is um, a fascinating one, but not an easy pursuit. Um, women's voices in ancient times were largely ignored or silenced in literature, in historical narratives, in philosophical discourse and political life. Since pursuits in the philosophical realm were predominantly viewed as a domain of elite men, Women, slaves, and other minorities are often left out of this narrative. Therefore, the sources on women in ancient times, what their lives were like and how they carried themselves, are not as extensive as we'd like. However, that's not to say that women did not participate in such activities. There is, in fact, some surviving and ample evidence of female philosophers who were just as influential and talented at their craft as their male counterparts. Um, to elaborate on this topic tonight, we have Dr. Emily Hume. Um, she's a lecturer of Greek philosophy at the University of Sydney. She previously held an appointment at, as uh, Seymour Reed in Greek history and philosophy at Ormond College, University of Melbourne. Her research interests include Plato's epistemology and ethics, philosophy of language from uh, Parmenides to the Stoics, and arguments concerning the status of women um, in the ancient world in antiquity. Enough of me, a big round of applause from our speaker tonight, Emily Hume. Huge, huge thank you to everyone for being here. Huge thank you to the Greek Center and huge thank you especially to Nick for that very generous introduction. And we'll get right into things with the um, study of women in Greek philosophy. And I start with this question, must one have a beard? Of course, a rhetorical question, must one have a beard to be 
a philosopher, but maybe one that is all the same, a familiar question, when we think about the existence of a certain image of what Greek philosophy is supposed to look like. So what I have for you here for us to start out with is a depiction of two of our most famous, two of our most well-known Greek philosophers, as depicted by the Renaissance painter Raphael in the School of Athens, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, Plato's the one in red, Aristotle's the one in blue. The traditional interpretation of this painting is that Plato is pointing towards the sky. Ah, thank you. Always good to get this sorted before, yeah, get too far into things. Plato's pointing towards the sky to the uh, ethereal realm of the forms, his abstract entities, which explain how things are in our world. And Aristotle, his pupil, is pointing him back down to the earth and saying that we need to be more realistic in our philosophy. So we have two of them. They have very different uh, views on many matters in philosophy. Uh, they wear red and blue. They might differ in all kinds of other ways. One's younger, one's older. But of course, both of them here are sporting these very impressive beards. Here's another example of a Greek philosopher. So this is a depiction of Epictetus. And you'll see that he too has a nice beard there. That's a Stoic philosopher, active maybe uh, about six centuries later than Plato and Aristotle. And then here's another depiction. Uh, this is Carneades. He's an academic skeptic philosopher, so active in the second century BC. And you'll see, again, has that um, uh, wonderful beard in his depiction. And one thing I'll mention now um, that's interesting about this is that if you think through to yourself about what I'm going to roughly just describe as male beauty standards through the ages, you might be familiar with, for example, if you're familiar with different historical figures, if you think of someone like Pericles, the great Athenian statesman, um, active just before the time of Plato, a contemporary of Socrates, you're imagining him probably with a beard, as he's often depicted. But then if in turn you imagine something like Julius Caesar, there's no beard, or Augustus, um, the Roman emperor, no beard. And what's gone on there is between Greek and Roman culture and between the centuries in between, there's been a shift in male beauty standards and adult men are no longer wearing these impressive beards with the exception of these sorts of philosophers that we're seeing here. And no doubt this is partly explained by an idea that philosophy is an uber Greek thing. It's associated with this specific time period of Greece, the time period of Plato and Aristotle. And so beards are, uh, um, part of what it takes to look like a philosopher. Of course, no offense made, uh, meant to any of the bearded members of the audience here. I saw K.O. lovingly tug at Kevin's <laughs> lustrous beard. And um, it, they are, of course, a very good feature of male beauty standards throughout time. And indeed, they're one that is still associated in many ways with philosophy. So this is a mo more recent philosopher, David Lewis. And you'll see that he also has one of these beautiful beards. Of course, what this then can open up onto as a bit of a question is what about those of us who don't have or um, can't have beards throughout time? Where do uh, especially women fit into the history of philosophy? And were there female Greek philosophers? Something I'll talk about today. As a bit of an introduction to this and then thinking through also how that relates to this stereotype about beards, because it is really a stereotype that Greek philosophers look that way. I want to tell you a little bit about a charming satirical work that was written in the Roman Empire by someone called Lucian, and the title of it is The Eunuch. And what happens in this satire is there is a contest for the chair of Aristotelian philosophy at Rome. And the academic job market apparently was no easier in the ancient world than it is today, so this was a heated contest. The two finalists had to face off against one another, and they went toe-to-toe -to -toe over Aristotle's ethics and over the metaphysics and over the theology. And finally, no real difference being between the two of them. One of them came to exasperation and said, this conversation doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, my opponent isn't someone that people would trust to be a philosopher. He really doesn't look the part because he's a eunuch, giving the title of this work. And he's not able to grow a beard, and so no student's going to trust him. They're just going to take one look at this guy and think he can't possibly know anything about philosophy. Now, of course, the eunuch has replies to this, and that includes referring to women who participated in philosophy as counterexamples. But it speaks to this kind of anxiety around that stereotype and what it would mean to be a philosopher who doesn't fit within it, one that we might think in certain ways can still endure today in the way that people imagine philosophers.
I'll give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the lecture today while trying to remain appropriately close to the microphone. So in the first part, I'll give a little bit of a historical introduction and talk a little bit about the sources that we have to look at. Um, Nick already in the introduction referred to some of the challenges with these, and I'll just go into a bit more detail. And then I'm going to talk about three specific cases. A cynic philosopher, that's a school of philosophy in the ancient world. I today won't have enough time to go into all the details about these schools of philosophy, but I, of course, welcome questions about them. Uh, Hipparchy of the Cynic. And then Theano, a Pythagorean philosopher. And finally, I will cast our eye at a work of Sappho's, who is known as a poet. That could be read as making a philosophical point, which I think is interesting in terms of what we're thinking about as potential sources for philosophy as we go across works known to be written by women in the ancient world or about women in the ancient world. So that's our outline. So I want to first, in introducing the sorts of sources we'll be thinking about and looking at, um, remind us of what sources we use when we study Greek history, literature, culture, and philosophy in the ancient world by and large. With small apologies to any of you that may have been at my last lecture a few years ago, I came and talked here about the Oracle of Dodona, and I think I had this exact slide to talk about um, some of that material as well. So uh, what I have on this slide is our three most famous Greek writers of tragedy, uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. So well-known, famous, famous, famous figures in their own lifetime and later. And one thing that we have to appreciate about what we have remaining from these authors is that most of it is missing. So what I have depicted here, the orange plus blue bar, are all the works that we think that each of these writers composed. So we have references, for example, in later writers that will say things like, Aeschylus wrote a play with this title and it won second prize or something like that. So we have orange plus blue equals all of the plays that we think they wrote, and blue are the ones that we actually have and can read today. So in short, we're looking at roughly like 10% of what we think that they wrote. And those are from the most famous writers in the ancient world. So what we've lost is really, really significant. Turning to Greek philosophy, I'll tell you a little bit about the different sources we use when we study canonical Greek philosophers, because a lot of it is going to be similar to that. There are some exceptions. There are some cases where it's better. There's some cases where it's worse. And that will be background for us as we're then thinking about the sorts of sources we use to study women in Greek philosophy. And I say this to sort of anticipate a first reaction, depending on which periods of history you um, are most familiar with and have studied, which is going to look like what I have to work on is sort of like grasping at threads. That's sort of true, but from the standpoint of Greek philosophy, there's a lot of philosophers where we're having to grasp at threads in that sort of way. It's, it's a familiar technique that we have to do this grasping. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're looking at when we study the philosophers I have on this list. So first of all, Socrates, well-known, household name, Greek philosophy, wrote nothing. So when we are studying uh, Socrates, we're having to work backwards through what other people wrote about him because he did not write anything. We most of all look at Plato, his student. There are other people that wrote about him too. We don't really have any serious doubts that he was a historical person or anything like that. But it's worth appreciating that this is an important philosopher who wrote nothing. So when we study his philosophy, it's not coming from careful analysis of verbatim writings of his, but rather the impact that he had on other people and what other people wrote about him. Very much the opposite case is Plato. Plato, uh, for those of us who study him, we, we get the unique privilege, to my knowledge, of any author in the ancient world. This is the only one that we have everything that they ever wrote. I would happily stand corrected, not least by my former colleague K.O., if he knows of any other authors this is true of. But to my knowledge, every other author, we have lost things by them. They're more like those Aeschylus cases I showed on the previous page. Whereas in Plato's case, Every time there's a later historical reference to a dialogue by Plato, it's a dialogue that we have and that we can read today. So we can actually read the works of Plato and study his philosophy that way. It doesn't necessarily make it easy. It keeps people like me in business that Plato wrote fictional dialogues, so we have to do some careful work in interpreting what his philosophy was. But we can read what he wrote and what he intended to be published and what he intended to communicate to people about his philosophical ideas. Aristotle is a 
unusual case in some ways. Aristotle wrote apparently beautiful philosophical works. For any of you that have read Aristotle, your ears might have already perked up at the word beautiful. Um, a lot of them today are known for not being that beautiful, and the reason why is the works we have were not intended to be read. So he wrote volumes of beautiful works. Those we have this long, bizarre historical story about that they got like eaten by moths and then burned, and then the dictator Sulla burned them again, and so on and so on and so on. What went on there, we don't really know all the details, but he had these works that were intended to be published and read by people that we don't read today. Instead, what we read today, if you go to readings in Carlton or any other good bookshop, you'll find Aristotle on the shelf. Um, but what you'll find are what we call his lecture notes, meaning the things that he wrote in preparation for lectures that he would give. We think. We're kind of unsure about a lot of this, and there's often a little weird qualifying note in any scholarship on Aristotle that will say something like, for all we know, maybe he didn't mean to write this, or maybe his student wrote this, or something like this, which is very worrying if you're coming from the background of studying someone like Plato, where we have the works he intended to have published and read. But we make do with Aristotle pretty well with this. That's still probably one of our better scenarios for Greek philosophy. The last one I'll mention, I won't get into um, Epicurus today, um, but the last one I'll mention is Zeno of Kidium. That's the founder of Stoicism. So big deal, canonical Greek philosopher, founder of Stoicism. When we study Zeno, it is not through lengthy works that he wrote. That would be wonderful if we did have those. We know that he wrote things like that. For example, he wrote A Republic, just like Plato wrote A Republic. What we instead have, though, are tiny scraps of what Zeno wrote. So other authors of things that are kind of like encyclopedias or textbooks in the ancient world who quote a little bit of Zeno, or they put in their own words a paraphrase of what Zeno thought, and then we cobble together those different little references and we figure out what the main doctrines of Stoicism were in Zeno's time period, and then we can think about and argue about that. And so that sort of process is pretty familiar to those of us who work in Greek philosophy as something that we have to do to understand some of these figures. Many of them are like that sort of Zeno case. And that's more or less what we are doing today when we look at women in Greek philosophy, where it's going to be things like biographical reports about these women, small quotations from them, that sort of thing. And then you're thinking through what the philosophical implications of them are, rather than something like a lengthy dialogue of Plato's being the sort of standard that we um, might want to have in mind. There are some lengthier works by women, especially letters by Neo-Pythagorean women, but by and large, they're going to be these sorts of shorter things that we are looking at. Turning then more precisely to women in Greek philosophy, female authors, as I um, already mentioned in terms of long works, pretty rare. References to small quotations from things like that from women, really common. And so one of the, the key things that I want um, you to take away from this talk, if nothing else, is that it's not at all rare for there to be um, references or evidence for women in Greek philosophy. Um, by my own count, there's definitely over 100 women who in different sources are associated with different philosophical schools. Some philosophical schools seem to have quite a number of women affiliated with them at different time periods. So there's no sense in which it um, is super, super rare for there to be women involved with Greek philosophy in a bunch of different philosophical schools over the long centuries um, um, that we think about in Greek philosophy. We shouldn't be naive about um, some of the challenges faced by women in Greek philosophy, something Nick already alluded to um, as well. And in particular, I'll draw your attention to an important double standard. There was a number of double standards that are relevant to um, thinking through women in Greek philosophy, but I'll draw your attention to one which I think is the most important for understanding some of what I'll talk about as we get into these um, philosophers today. And this is the double standard around education which I think has to be understood in connection with a double standard around political life. So as many of you may be familiar with, um, there's, uh, Greek culture in the ancient world in, for example, the time of Plato and Aristotle was not a monolith. There was many different city-states and they had many different cultural and political practices. Um, a lot of what I'm about to say right now would be true of many, um, if not all of these city-states, but I'll just um, describe the case of Athens as an example. There are lots of interesting things to say about um, um, uh, different uh, city-states, um, but I'll, I'll just stick to Athens for simplicity right now. So in Athens, uh, it's a democracy during most of that time period, um, time period of Plato and Aristotle. Um, 
And uh, so under the Athenian democracy, political life is going to look like all citizen men um, get a say in political matters in the assembly where you would go in person to debate directly policy matters. So are we going to invade Sparta or something like that? And then people could get up on one side and argue for it. People could get up on another side and argue against it. In that sort of scenario, if you are the scion of a wealthy Athenian family, you may well have ambitions to be respected and influential in your society. You don't live under an oligarchy, so it's not that by definition you get to be influential because you have money, but rather the route to being influential um, in your society is going to go via when those assembly meetings happen that people listen to you. How are you going to get people to listen to you? Well, being a well-educated person is one way of doing that, not just because people respect education, that might be true too, but especially if you've sort of honed your craft of being a persuasive speaker as someone um, that is going to be listened to, is going to offer arguments that people respect, well, that would get you sort of de facto political power. If you were able to be someone that people really thought had something to say, had something uh, meaningful to say, um, and was something that they would listen to. And so that sort of uh, dynamic was very well observed by wealthy families in this time period. And so they would have their sons be really well educated, especially in things that we would call like language arts, rhetoric, oratory, in order that they could effectively wield political power via the fact that they were persuasive in these sorts of debates in the assembly. So when the question came up, should we invade Sparta? They were the first person everyone looked to and the things that they said really counted and were weighty. So, these families are training up their sons. They're not gonna train up their daughters for the very straightforward reason that the daughters are not in the assembly. So there's no point in educating women, or at that point girls, for a role in influencing political matters that is never going to be available to them because they're not going to, in fact, um, be allowed into the assembly, so they're not gonna be able to wield political power in that sense. So education for women doesn't really make sense in that sort of context. So that's one really big standard uh, in the ancient world, that sort of political double standard that's going on, and then the education double standard that goes on too. And this, of course, will have implications for women in philosophy because education and philosophy often go together. In spite of all that, I'll give you some examples of women who did participate in philosophy, so against all of that. Um, and we'll see how they made important contributions. Um, but always sort of against this background of, in many ways, that double standard and other ones manifesting in the way that they had to negotiate the way that they did philosophy relative to their male peers. The last thing that I'm going to take us through um, before we get to some of these um, female philosophers is a little bit of Aristotle. The reason that I'm taking us through um, Aristotle is because he's a really helpful, important foil for the um, female philosophers that I'm going to show you. Um, I feel like I should preface this with um, uh, the following remark, which is that I find uh, uh, Aristotle to be a phenomenal philosopher who really challenges a lot of the ways that we think about things today and an excellent philosopher to study. You'll see that I'm using him as sort of a misogynist foil um, in this talk, but it's not because I don't think that he's a philosopher well worth um, studying in other rights, including earlier in the politics, the very text that I will be taking us through. So in the politics, one of the claims that he makes earlier on, one of the remarkable claims that I think is um, wonderful for us to think through today, is that he thinks that the community comes before the individual. So a really important challenge for those of us that are more individualistic minded today is the way that Aristotle carves out an idea of community coming before individual. One implication of this though, in the way that Aristotle tells the story, is that people have different roles in the community that are these sort of natural hierarchies, or so he thinks. And he specifically articulates what he takes to be natural hierarchies between different groups of people, three specific cases being really relevant, free people and enslaved people, men and women, and parents and children. And so in discussing these, he then goes into this passage, which I'll go ahead and read and then explain what's going on in it. So I'll try to, yeah, I'll, I'll use this and I can read off of this view. So free people and enslaved people, men and women, and children and adults all possess the various parts of the soul, but possess them in different ways. 
for the slave has not got the deliberative part at all, and the female has it, but without full authority, while the child has it, but in an undeveloped form. So already now I'll pause and explain some of what's going on here. So he gives that list of three binaries that I just um, articulated. So free people and enslaved people, men and women, and children and adults. And then he's claiming that all of these groups of people have all the parts of the soul. In modern English, we would probably understand this as more like has all the same mental capacities. So soul is a bit of a um, maybe a dated word for this. Obviously, it's suke in Greek, origin of our word psychology. I would say that psychology is the study of the mind. So in that sense, it's like the study of the mind. So he's claiming psychologically all these groups of people have the same capacities in some sense. But then he says that there's something different about all these groups, he claims. So specifically something to do with what he's calling the deliberative part as a first pass for today. I'm just going to construe that as basically rationality. And what he's claiming is that enslaved people lack rationality. Won't get into what he's claiming about that uh, for today's lecture, although you're welcome to ask me about it if you'd like. Um, then for women, he says that they um, have the deliberative part, but it doesn't have full authority. So kind of putting it in our own terms, he's roughly saying something like, women have rationality, but it doesn't have the same strength as rationality in men. As becomes clear elsewhere in Aristotle, what he has in mind is kind of the common stereotype along the lines of women are more emotional, emotion dislodges reason, so they don't stand by their reasonable decisions the way that, men's do, that men do. That's roughly the idea he has. And then in talking about children, he says that they have rationality, but it hasn't developed all the way yet. So that's the claim he makes in, these series of, um, in this series here. And then I'll go on with the rest of the passage. We must suppose, therefore, um, the same necessity holds good of the moral virtues. All must partake of them, but not in the same way, but in such measure as is proper to each in relation to his own function. Probably given that we're talking about women here, their own function would probably be more useful. So each partakes of virtues in relation to their own function. Hence it is manifest that all the persons mentioned have a moral virtue of their own, and that the temperance of a woman and that of a man are not the same, nor their courage and justice as Socrates thought. So a lot of this terminology might be um, really unusual and, and new to you, so I'll, I'll try to put in our own words what point he's trying to make here. Basically, the point that Aristotle is trying to make here is that he thinks that different types of humans, most relevant for us, men versus women, have different kinds of rational capacities. And then he thinks that a consequence of this is that what is right and wrong for men versus women is different as a consequence of that. Let me give you an um, uh, analogous example to try to make sense of this. So take the um, significantly, really, really a lot less problematic case of what he's saying about children here. So he's claiming children's rationality is not fully developed. And you might think that really does then have implications for how we assess good and bad behavior. So if a little kid hits their brother, we, of course, might want to say that, you know, we need to um, correct them, we need to show them that that's the wrong thing to do and all of that sort of thing. But it's different than a full adult hitting their brother, where we think they have the rational capacity to know not to do that. And so we might, for example, think that a full adult doing that is much more blameworthy than a little kid. So there's some kind of corresponding ethical evaluation we make depending on what we take someone's cognitive capacities to be. So getting back to Aristotle, roughly that's what's going on here. He's thinking that in his language, the moral virtues are different for men and women. And that's his way of expressing that sort of thought, that he thinks that right and wrong for men and women is not going to be the same. On this, he is responding to what was a set question in the ancient world. I like to describe this as like in the ancient world, in Greek philosophy, there are a set of questions that are the equivalent of like the trolley problem today, where a philosopher today will tell you how they interpret the trolley problem, what their reaction is to it, and it's just like a stock question. One of the stock questions in the ancient world was this question of, are the virtues of men and women the same or different? And that's their way of asking the question of, is right and wrong um, different for men or for women? And Aristotle here claims to be disagreeing with Socrates. So Socrates is saying right and wrong the same for men and women, and Aristotle's saying, no, it's not, because their cognitive capacities are different. So that's a summary of what's going on here. And Aristotle then just sort of elaborates a little bit more at the end. 
Hence we hold that of all these persons, ah, excuse me, hence we must hold that all of these persons have their appropriate virtue as the poet said of woman, silence gives grace to woman, though that is not the case likewise with a man. So here he is referring to a line of Sophocles, the great tragedian, and he is quoting approvingly this idea that silence is appropriate for women, but not appropriate for men. So in the Athenian assembly, when the question comes up, should we invade Sparta? Um, or maybe at, at a, um, a, a co-ed event, where you could even imagine women being in the audience if someone asks, should we invade Sparta? The idea is it's appropriate for men to chip in with their opinion, but inappropriate for women to do so. That's the claim being made here in Aristotle. So we'll see um, some of the philosophers today responding to that kind of line of thinking and the sorts of double standards that are the mentality behind it that you can see, I think, just very clearly articulated in this passage from Aristotle. So I'll begin then with Hipparchia. So Hipparchia was a Cynic philosopher. I'll say a little bit as uh, becomes relevant over time about what Cynic philosophy was all about. We know about Hipparchia from a biography of Hipparchia. This biography comes from an author by the name of Diogenes Laertius. Diogenes Laertius wrote a very popular book in the ancient world called The Lives of Eminent Philosophers, where he gives biographies of all of these different philosophers, many of them, uh, from all kinds of different philosophical schools. He's writing in roughly the third century CE, so he goes back to um, the person often considered the first philosopher, Thales, and tells the story of philosophy from there. His book is the source of a ton of our information about Greek philosophy. The sort of canon that he established for who counts as a Greek philosopher um, has had a huge influence on how Greek philosophy is understood. Hipparchia is the only woman he gives a biography of. I think that itself is inherently interesting. And then I think the details in this biography are incredibly interesting as well. The biography is not very long, so I will read all of it. It's just spread across these two slides, and I think we'll see lots of different interesting things in it. So I'll begin with this first bit. Metrically's sister, Hipparchia, was also captivated by his words, that is, Crates words. So her brother, Metricles, is also a Cynic philosopher, and then Crates, the person she's going to eventually marry, also a Cynic philosopher. So Hipparchia was captivated by his words. They were both from Myronea, and she fell in love with Crates, both his words and his way of life, having no regard for any of her suitors, not wealth or high birth or good looks. Crates was everything for her. When her parents implored Crates to discourage their daughter, he tried everything. And finally, when he failed to dissuade her, he stood up in front of her, took off his clothes and said, here is your groom and here is what he owns. Make your decision accordingly, for you won't be my partner unless you adopt the same ways too. So I'll bring out a couple things um, already, although a lot of the meaty stuff happens in the next bit. So what's happening here is Cynic philosophy, in a nutshell, is an extremely anti-conventional philosophy in the ancient world. The Cynics took themselves to be followers of Socrates. They took the Socratic mission to do philosophy, to live, um, uh, to live the examined life, was to uh, completely disregard uh, conventionally valuable things, including personal grooming, including money, including fame. So they did things like uh, live without homes, so they basically were homeless, living on the streets. Um, they wouldn't worry about their clothes. They'd have like one ratty robe, basically. Um, they would insult Alexander the Great to his face. They just didn't care about any of that kind of thing. So we have these kind of amazing, but also bizarre stories about these philosophers and their extremely anti-conventional life. So uh, she falls in love with Crates, the cynic philosopher. When he strips himself naked and shows himself to her, that is part and parcel of this idea of he doesn't have any property, possessions, money. We already see earlier on she's disregarding the suitors with their good looks and money and so doesn't care about those sorts of things. And he's just emphasizing the point that his cynic philosophy, which is amounts to a cynic way of life, is going to be a way of life where they don't have any money. All that he has is literally his body, essentially. So uh, his... Uh, he actually did try to apparently dissuade her. Um, as you can imagine, uh, her parents were very concerned about the fact she'd fallen in love with this guy. Um, but nevertheless, she decides to marry him. And the story continues here. The girl made her choice, put on the same clothes, and went everywhere with her husband, having sex in the open and going to dinners with him. I always find this sentence to be a really bizarre non sequitur between the having sex in the open and going to dinners. Um, what's going on here? Okay. Okay. 
I said they're really anti-conventional. This includes they do not acknowledge like a public-private distinction. So I already said that they didn't have homes, so that might already be a tip-off that um, having a private place to uh, conduct sexual relations is not on the cards for them. So um, in fact, we get lots of stories about cynics and things like masturbating or having sex in public. So this is sort of part and parcel of stories about cynics. Um, are they supposed to be kind of crazy stories? Probably to some degree, but it's part of their, again, extremely anti-conventional philosophy that they just don't observe the sorts of common distinctions we might observe of things like things being appropriate for only private life versus in public. So she goes into the cynic way of living and I'll continue reading from there. Once they attended a drinking party hosted by Lysimachus and she confuted Theodorus the godless, as he was called, by posing a sophism like this. Anything that would not be called unjust for Theodorus to do would not be called unjust for Hipparchia to do either. But Theodorus does nothing unjust in beating himself, so Hipparchia does nothing unjust in beating him either. When Theodorus had no rejoinder to offer, he pulled up her cloak, but Hipparchia was neither shocked nor mortified as a woman would be. Rather, when he went on to say, is this the woman who left behind the shuttles on her loom? Yes, that's me, Theodorus, she said, but surely you don't think I made a bad decision if the time I was going to spend on the loom I devoted to education. Those and countless other stories are told about this philosopher. All right, so turning back to the stories here. So we have this interaction then told about Hipparchia, our protagonist, and this famous atheist, Theodorus the Godless, starting with a sophism, that's a word for a bad argument, uh, which goes as follows, anything that would not be called unjust for Theodorus to do would not be called unjust for Hipparchia to do either. Theodorus does nothing unjust in beating himself, so Hipparchia does nothing unjust in beating him either. So, bad argument. But what I want us to pay attention to is, to use the philosophical term, the first premise. That is the first line of it. What is going on here is that she is rejecting the thing that Aristotle had claimed. So what she is saying here is that right and wrong is the same for men and women, to put it in sort of more everyday language, because nothing that's unjust for him to do is unjust for her to do, irrespective of gender differences, or any other differences for that matter. So the fact that they're using the word justice probably makes that clear. Justice is also one of the canonical virtues in Greek philosophy. So when they talk about questions about are the virtues the same for men and women, this would be a core example, this justice example. So in other words, Hipparchia here is subscribing to, articulating what we would describe as an egalitarian philosophy. So same for men and for women in terms of right and wrong. This is something that is not um, unusual for a cynic to subscribe to. So we think the cynics in general had this sort of view. So she's subscribing to this cynic view of egalitarianism between men and women. But as the story goes on, I think we can see how the stakes of that are different in the life that she's going to live versus someone like Crates, for example, or her brother. So when Theodorus has no rejoinder to offer, he pulled up her cloak. So I think this is a... Um, interesting uh, doublet in this story. That's a word for when something repeats. Uh, the theme of nakedness. In fact, the theme of nakedness seems to be all over this story, but specifically we have Crates pulling up his cloak earlier on the previous slide, showing Hipparchia that he has nothing. And then we have Hipparchia, um, who is getting kind of like the ancient version of pants by this famous atheist. What I want to draw your attention to with this is that the stakes of nakedness are not the same for men and women in this context. Um, the best example I can give of this um, is in ancient Greek art. Of course, it's conventional that men are depicted naked, but not so for women. It's a moment of great fanfare in Greek art when there start being depictions of naked women. And in that moment of great fanfare, there's a whole story about how the first sculptor to depict Aphrodite naked. The city that paid for that sculpture didn't want the naked version. They had him do a clothed version instead because there's definitely a taboo about female nakedness. You could also think in this context about men um, uh, participating in athletic contests like at Olympia naked in the ancient world, whereas there are athletic contests for women in the ancient world. Another moment I'd be happy to be corrected on, but I've never seen a depiction of them where they're not clothed. They always seem to be clothed. So there's just a double standard around nakedness for men and women that it's supposed to be shameful for women. And you see that reflected in the next line. Hipparchia was neither shocked nor mortified as a woman would be because it would be something that's more mortifying for her than, for example, for Crates. Not saying that Crates getting pants wouldn't be um, uh, something that would call attention to and be embarrassing in certain ways, just that the stakes are different for the two of them. And it then continues sort of down this line in certain ways where Theodorus is pressing this point clearly 
um, taking shots at her as a woman. Is this the woman who left behind the shuttles on the loom? And she's saying, yes, that's me, Theodorus, but surely you don't think I made a bad decision at the time I was going to spend on the loom I devoted to education. So really just reasserting over and over this egalitarian point that she um, expects and will be treated the same way as, um, as men, uh, being a female philosopher. Although I think we can see through the story, the way that that's actually happening in real life um, comes off rather differently than it would be for a man, where we wouldn't expect, for example, someone taking stabs at, um, that he should be working on his weaving and stuff like that. I'll move on then to another philosopher, Theano. I'll just say a little bit about Theano. So Theano is a Pythagorean philosopher. Pythagoreans are best known for their contributions in mathematics, including the Pythagorean theorem. There are a lot of women associated with the Pythagorean school. Um, their writings, I think, are very fascinating. I'm just going to mention one short one, which I think is very striking because it reads like an exact reply to Aristotle, which is something which hasn't been appreciated in the scholarship um, until now. Uh, to my knowledge, there may well be, you know, imminent uh, work on this that um, I'm not familiar with yet. So uh, we already saw in the politics, Aristotle on the topic of silence and speech and women saying silence gives grace to a woman. So he's quoting Sophocles there, as I already mentioned, and he's quoting that with approval. So Aristotle has this view that um, right and wrong are different for men and women. And the example that he gives is over speech, that it's appropriate for men to speak up on things that matter, but not for women, for example. Theano, this Pythagorean philosopher, has this following saying attributed to her. There are things which it is fine to discuss. About these things, it is shameful to remain silent. There are also things which it is shameful to discuss. About these things, it's preferable to remain silent. So I'm going to bring out the work that she's doing here in this sentence. So she, in this, has just moved the idea about there being an appropriateness to language off of the gender of the person and onto the topic. So we can imagine a concrete example along these lines. So if someone um, says something horribly um, rude or mean or offensive to someone else, you might think it's appropriate to intervene and say that was um, not the right thing to say, you shouldn't treat them that way. And she's saying it would be shameful to remain silent if you witness something like that. And there's no distinction here of the gender of the person being relevant to whether you should speak up on something like that or not. And then thinking of another concrete case where silence is appropriate, if you were, you know, in a bored moment planning on like telling a dirty joke at a funeral or something like that, not appropriate. And she's saying, doesn't matter what gender you are, it's appropriate to remain silent in those cases rather than to discuss them. So it's just moving completely away from this Aristotelian account where the gender is relevant and the right or wrong of the speech action is determined by the gender of the person and onto the topic and saying that there is right and wrong in speech, but it's nothing to do with who's saying it, it's with the topic. And there's times when it would be shameful to remain silent and there's times when it's completely appropriate and advisable to remain silent. So I think this is a sort of wonderful repartee to something like what Aristotle says. Um, I won't, for the sake of time, go into the um, uh, second piece of Theano I have, although it again seems to be where she is um, offering a correction on Aristotle, which I think is, is quite interesting. Where I'll end things today is with a brief look in at another possible Greek philosopher. So one thing in terms of thinking about women in Greek philosophy is thinking about some of these women that we have biographies of, um, uh, sayings from, that sort of thing, and what that says about them as philosophers and thinking through the views that they're expressing and how those relate to other views that we know about from this time period. Another thing that we can think about is women who have not been understood as philosophers and whether they perhaps ought to be. And so I'm thinking through the option of understanding Sappho this way, not least because she is our uh, best known author, um, female author from ancient Greece. Um, and was someone who was fabulously well regarded as a poet. Um, in ancient Greek philosophy, that someone would be um, a poet and a philosopher is perfectly possible. Um, they didn't think that the like standard of excellence for philosophical work was the journal article in the ancient world. So it's possible that you could have a poet being understood as a philosopher. And of course, the, um, the real work will be in looking at her words and seeing if we think that they're is a way of understanding them as making an important philosophical contribution, which is what I will argue that they are. Before I get to that, I will just mention a little bit about, you know, no one in the ancient world um, 
uh, didn't acknowledge the incredible um, uh, uh, work of Sappho, at least as a poet. Here's a quotation that's attributed to Plato, the philosopher. Plato refers to Sappho a few times in these kind of florid terms. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. So some say there are nine muses, how thoughtless. Look at Sappho with love, so she makes a tenth. Um, this is just attributed to Plato, less clear whether Plato really said this or not, but he definitely speaks of it really highly elsewhere, and that's really common for other authors in um, ancient Greece. So here's the poem that I want us to take a look at. I'll go ahead and read the whole thing. Our focus is gonna end up being on the first stanza, so those first few lines. I'll move this this way again to um, be able to read this. So some say a ho host of horsemen is the most beautiful thing on the black earth. Some say a host of foot soldiers. Some a fleet of ships. But I say it's what everyone loves. Wholly easy is it to make this intelligible to everyone. For she, who by far surpassed all humankind in beauty, Helen, forsook her husband, noblest of men, to sail away to Troy. Neither of child nor of beloved parents did she take thought at all, being led astray by, this is a fragmentary work, so some stuff is missing, get more missing stuff for pliant lightly, now has brought Anactoria to my mind, though she is absent. I'd rather see her lovely step and the glancing brightness of her face than Lydian chariots and foot soldiers arrayed in armor. So the thing that I will have us um, focus on, as I already mentioned, is that first stanza. Um, of course, there's all sorts of beautiful things to point out about the formal poetry here and what's going on with that. But we'll just be focusing on looking at that first stanza and thinking through um, understanding that as making a specific kind of philosophical contribution on the topic of what beauty is. So some say a host, a host of uh, foot soldiers is the most beautiful thing. Some say a host, uh, excuse me, host of horsemen, then horse, host of foot soldiers, then fleet of ships. But I say it's whatever one loves. So one of the most uh, celebrated moments in Greek philosophy is the elucidation of what a definition is. Definitions are really important for Greek philosophy. The way that this gets introduced and the sort of typical story that we tell about definitions in Greek philosophy is that they are a Socratic, so related to Socrates, innovation, so something Socrates invented and that was refined, especially by Aristotle, and that we see them discussed in Plato's dialogues when Plato discusses what we, and this is a uh, term of art in Greek philosophy, call what is X questions, or in Greek we call them TST questions. So a what is X question is a question about definition, so what is and then it's the thing to be defined, and in many Socratic dialogues, these are specifically over kinds of virtue, so it'll be a question like what is courage, for example, that's the key question in a Socratic dialogue called the Lakeys by Plato. And then what happens is, these are dialogues, so someone asks the question and someone tries to answer it, and the first answer that we get in specifically this dialogue that I mentioned, Lakeys, is that that's easy enough to answer. What is courage? It's standing firm in the line of battle. This immediately gets rejected by Socrates in this dialogue because of, for example, the idea that someone could be courageous in illness. And so that obviously is incompatible with the definition of courage being standing firm in the line of battle because that's taken to be a case of courage that has nothing to do with standing, uh, uh, it's a case of courage that has nothing to do with standing firm in the line of battle. There's more to say about what makes something a good definition, but what generally comes out of at least those first steps in what makes something a good definition is that definitions need to be properly general, or sometimes we say universal, and needs to capture all relevant cases. Something like standing firm in the line of battle is going to fail as a definition of courage, in other words, because it's not properly general, it's not universal enough. There are counterexamples of things that count as cases of courage but don't fit under that definition. So you need to get the size right would be one way of thinking about it. So the idea then would be that we could consider the possibility of looking at what Sappho is doing in this first stanza as doing something like that. I think um, there may have been in this time period from a few other sources that seem to pose this question too, some debate over what counted. Um, maybe it's in the time period after her, maybe it's the time period around her, over what counts as beauty. Um, especially people working in art, of course, have good reason to think about that sort of topic. And what she's saying here is this. Some say a host of horsemen is the most beautiful thing. Some say a host of foot soldiers. Some a fleet of ships. But I say it's what everyone loves. So, in other words, specific examples, host of horsemen, fleet of ships, are not going to count as what beauty is, but rather we need this properly general definition. It's whatever one loves. So we can see then this idea that we're getting a um, general definition here. 
A few more things that I'll point out about, if we're interpreting it that way, what's going on in the kind of definition that she's offering. So Plato, writing um, a couple centuries after Sa uh, Sappho, chips in with the definition of beauty uh, in the symposium, one of his uh, most famous dialogues. So when Plato talks about beauty, asking the same sort of what is beautiful question, he wants to understand it in terms of an abstract form, an objective thing out there in the world that different things in our world participate in. That's not the sort of way that Sappho is describing it here. So she's describing beauty as what we might call a relational term. A way of putting this would be something like beauty's in the eye of the beholder seems to be the thrust of this definition. And there's a little bit more we can even say about this and I'll use this to wrap up. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder could be what we take away from this. One thing that we could um, uh, add as a nuance to this is that it, that doesn't necessarily mean in any sense that it has to be understood as something like artificial, for example, or unreal. It's just emphatically something that comes about from human actions, if it's a relational term. It's something that we can see in other people or other things, not something that's independent of our perceptions of them. And that's something that um, uh, gets into another interesting topic um, in uh, Greek philosophy, which is that that sort of idea that there's real things that are the product of interactions is something that gets described in later Epicurean philosophy when they're trying to analyze and assess things like the experiences of color and taste. So they think, for example, um, like colors are not out there in the world. So if I see a peach and I perceive it as orange, but a dog sees it and it doesn't perceive it as, as orange, that proves that there's no orangeness out there in the world. But nevertheless, the experience of that orangeness is very real. It has to do with the relationship that I and my perceptive faculties, my eye, the conditions, the lighting, that sort of thing, have with the experience that I have. So it's a real experience, even though it's one that's not intrinsically out there in the world. So the nice little thing that we could tie off with and think about Sappho here, this, de this definition would yield an idea where she's defining beauty. In it, she's saying that love is real, and that's a good place perhaps to end with contributions of women to Greek philosophy. Thank you. If I turn it on. Uh, thank you, Emily, for that um, presentation. The floor is open to questions. Um, I might kick start off um, the questioning. Um, when I think of women philosophers in ancient mm -hmm. Greece, probably the one that first comes to mind, apart from Sappho, mm -hmm. is probably um, Hippatia, probably helped by the moving Agora as well. Why didn't she make your short list? Mm. I know that you've got limited time, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, most of all, yeah. I, uh, Hypatia is an extremely interesting one. I most of all am right now working on ones that are um, less well known, basically, um, than her. So it's really not um, to discount at all her mm -hmm. contributions, but more to bring to light different ones and specifically earlier ones. Because yes. um, I think sometimes we'll end up with this impression, and maybe there's even truth to it, of that this changes and becomes more common later over time, whereas there's less appreciation for some of the earlier figures. Okay. okay. But yeah, definitely a, a part That's of the story. Timeline time yeah, yeah, related. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, they're normally an inquisitive lot here. Professor Gossa. Emily, thank you so much. You mentioned that we have in our sources quotations of letters mm -hmm. yep. written by female philosophers. Can you talk a little bit about what the contents of those letters are and yep. perhaps the, pers what the intended audience yep. or reader or recipient, I should say, of those yep. letters? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, these letters are really, really interesting. So most of our letters are by Pythagorean or Neo-Pythagorean authors. Those two terms in of themselves, it's hard to know what the actual dates of these things are. Um, but by and large, it's Pythagorean women. A lot of what they talk about is um, uh, sort of on the topic of, I mean, there's, there's a few different things that come up in them. But one of the key topics that, it, that comes up a lot is actually... Um, kind of day-to-day -day life matters. One of the topics I find the most interesting in the day-to-day -day life matters that they talk about is that they'll get into this question about virtues of men and women. One of the topics that comes up the most often is adultery, basically. And why this is interesting, you'll be well familiar with this, is there's a double standard around adultery in the ancient world. Pythagoreans are actually not supposed to follow that double standard. So for everyone else's benefit, uh, when talking about Greek gender, sexuality, stuff like that, one of the key points that I find myself 
always having to explain to students is that there's a massive double standard on adultery in the ancient world where adultery is only a woman having an affair with anyone that is not her husband, but the other way around is fine. Men can have sex with um, prostitutes, other guys, et cetera, um, anyone that's not someone else's wife, but it's not that he owes monogamy to his wife, basically, and that's just like an accepted default across many Greek um, city-states. The Pythagoreans are an exception. So uh, Pythagoras apparently insisted that it has to be equal between men and women, so therefore none of this double standard around adultery, but that clearly is not the reality in the social world of these Pythagorean writers because a lot of them are talking about this and then how that intersects with different conceptions of virtue. So I think these are really interesting texts as sort of a window on both of these topics around gender and virtue that, um, that we see and then also specifically around another double standard that comes into play where there's a philosophical school that says that life is supposed to be this way and there's a social reality that's not being followed and they're having to negotiate what to do consequent upon that. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, is there any uh, surviving uh, writings uh, other than say Sappho and uh, the very early uh, women, like pre-Socratics perhaps? Mm -hmm. And also I was, I was wondering, uh, have you looked at, uh, um, at some of the anthropological writings about the establishment of patriarchy in mm. ancient Greece and how it came about? Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, the answer to the second question is no. Um, the answer to the first question is these Pythagorean or Neo-Pythagorean authors, uh, and I say that that way because different scholars assign them to different time periods. If they're Pythagorean, that would be like around 600 BC. That would definitely be pre-Socratic period. So those would be women um, in a philosophical school that have writings from that time period. So that would be the major pre-Socratic um, women philosophers. Most of the other ones are coming from either the time period of Plato and Aristotle or later Hellenistic schools. So there's, for example, a ton of um, Epicurean women. Um, um, but yeah. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. Um, the story of Hipparchia and mm -hmm. Theodorus, mm -hmm. um, with this drinking party, presumably mm -hmm. symposium, mm -hmm. uh, would Hipparchia actually have been invited or did she crash the party? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I hadn't thought about this. So, yeah, this is definitely, I'm just thinking through um, the exact imagined context for this going to dinners with him at a drinking party hosted by Lysimachus. Um, I haven't looked at the Greek text of this in a minute, but you have to be right. If they're transiting as drinking party, I'm sure it means symposium. Of course, traditionally, we always say that women were not at symposia. There's always the nuance that there were women at symposia, but they were women that were working at the symposia. Um, like flute girls, not someone invited like her. So how is she there? Is this completely imagined? Has the context been switched? Did she crash it? Uh, did uh, Crates insist that she get invited or he wasn't going to come? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I just hadn't thought about that nuance. But yes, definitely it's not normal um, that she would be there. So thank you for the question and sorry that I don't have an answer. <laughs> it would be worth it. It would be worth it there at the symposium. As a flute girl? I think that's unlikely. Yeah. It doesn't seem like she has a job. Yeah. I don't think so, yeah. It, it doesn't seem very cynic to have a job, yeah. In the way that it's, yeah, in the way it's being described here, it definitely doesn't, I, I mean, the, the way that a woman would be treated as a flute girl, I think is pretty different than what we're seeing described here. That's a good point. Thank you for the talk. Um, did I see a list of references on one of those yeah. overheads? Yeah, yeah. So, there we go. Okay, just keep it there for a second. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Hey, go for it. Nick, here you go. And I'm happy to even mention, in particular, um, the Sarah Pomeroy book. I really highly recommend. 
uh, for a number of reasons, but especially I think one of the things that's very interesting about this book and Pythagorean women uh, in general is that Pythagorean women are by and large Doric, equals something more like women from Sparta sort of thing. Gender norms in Sparta are quite different than in Athens. So a lot of times when we talk about Greek women and we talk about how um, uh, they didn't participate in public life, for example, the picture was quite different in Sparta. Um, many people have a much more optimistic picture of life for women in Sparta participating in things like athletics, for example. And the fact that there's a lot of Pythagorean women and that they're more like that kind of cultural background is, I think, quite interesting. So Pomeroy brings out a lot of those dimensions of social life, cultural background, and Pythagoreanism as a philosophical school. Okay, is there one final question before we close proceedings? Okay. Oh. I wondered if you could go back to the slide of Sappho, mm -hmm. Sappho 16. Mm -hmm. Yep. This of course, yes, of course, Sappho is incomparable. I mean, she's absolutely, her poetry is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had not thought of this as a kind of proto what is X question, yeah. but I wondered if I could get your reactions on yeah. how you might see it as a proto philosophical dialogue, but not mm. in the form of a dialogue because mm -hmm. of course she's not, uh, she's giving all the yeah. answers here. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting the exempla she uses yeah. for yeah. what is whatever she loves. Yeah. Helen, yeah. of all people, yeah. is described as the proof that well, she fell in love with Paris, yeah. who is, interestingly enough, not described yeah. as the noblest yeah. of men. Yeah. It's actually yeah. the worthless husband, Menelaus, who's actually described here as yeah. the noblest of men. But yeah. she, and uh, then also the other proof is kind of the way it ends, mm -hmm. which is the, de the uh, yeah. desire she has for the missing Anactoria, yep. which she then goes back to the beginning yeah. of the story by comparing... Yeah. The that is being more what yeah. she wants to see than anything that's uh, to yeah. do with war or the beauty of an army and that sort yeah, of yeah. thing. So I wonder what you think about this as like a proto dialogue without the dialogue, yeah. or, or you know, what your thoughts are on that from yeah. a philosophical point of view. Yeah. No, I, I'd be no, maybe I'd love to invite the dialogue with you further uh, on this um, in terms of what you think. It seems to me like I mean one of the most striking things I think from the very beginning of it is. Who of us would have thought the first examples that come to mind of the most beautiful thing is a military example? And not just that, it's only military examples. Um, so horsemen, uh, host of foot shoulders, fleet of ships. I mean, we both grew up in the United States where certainly like military parade is perceived as something beautiful, but probably not three times over versus people we find beautiful, songs we find beautiful the ocean side, you know, there's lots more examples that people would usually come up with. So I think it's a really striking example. And then of course, one that she's gonna circle back to at the end. It seems to me that then it does get like mixed in somehow with this Helen story, which is of course about beauty and love, but is also like about the Trojan War sublimated in there where all these different beauty things are getting mixed together. We're thinking of like catalog of ships book two is now the most beautiful thing, a surprise to all of us. And then we go back to the personal example of a specific person, finally, at the end. I mean, maybe on some level it's that you're waiting for it to get a normal example until you get to the end of what's something or someone that's beautiful. Um, so yeah, as a bit of a dialogue, I mean, I do think that there's, I mean, maybe the way I just described it is almost like a dialectic um, that's happening in the poem where you're going back and forth between different ideas about it. And this Helen one is slightly askew from uh, the main point in the first stanza. Is that what you had in mind? Or one. that's one way of thinking of it? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. There's something, yeah, there's something at least I've never totally wrapped my mind around of how the Helen example makes it easy to understand. The first part, maybe this is just the philosopher in me, totally gets. The last part, I get too. The middle part, confusing. Okay, one final question. I, I, I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of playwrights, you, you, you mm -hmm. quoted uh, Soph Sophocles. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking uh, some of the plays, uh, like the Trojan Women or mm -hmm. uh, Iphigenia mm -hmm. or Aristophanes, mm -hmm. uh, Lysistrata. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these could be interpreted as being against the patriarchy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think 
since it's the last question, I don't want to go on too long. But one of the things that I'll, this is this is a response to your comment and an elaboration of it in some sense. One of the things that I find most fascinating in some of these plays, one of the ones you didn't mention, is the Medea. Yeah. I don't think I've ever taught the Medea, um, and Ko can tell me if he's ever taught the Medea and read the speech of Medea to the women and had not a reaction among the women in the audience that's like, wow, she nailed it. Like, this is like the same as like Greta Gertwig's Barbie movie. Like, she's totally nailed it. And then you remind people, Euripides, a dude, wrote it. And so clearly, there's a degree to which um, all kinds of different writers can speak to all kinds of different themes. And I think in Greek tragedy, you can definitely see at least one theme that comes up a lot is rejecting patriarchy. Okay, um, I think we might bring proceedings to a close. Uh, Emily, just a small gift from oh, the Greek really community of Melbourne. Yeah. Book on, on the landscapes of Melbourne. Big oh, round of applause for our speaker tonight. And um, hope to see you all next week as well. Thank you.